Thousands of women are finding that economical, no-rubbing Aero Wax makes dingy old floors shine and sparkle, look like new. Just apply, and in six to nine minutes, it dries to a hard, lustrous waxed finish that saves countless scrubbings and polishings. Yet Aero Wax costs only 25 cents a pint at grocery, hardware, drug, and chain stores. Get Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X. Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Kalanos Toothpaste present Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his files and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. But first, is your smile everything you'd like it to be? Bright, sparkling, magnetic? If not, try the new Colonel's toothpaste thousands are raving about. It's a high-polishing toothpaste that acts like a jeweler's polish in removing tarnish from silver. Quickly, but also gently, Kalinos erases stubborn surface film from your teeth, revealing all their glorious natural brilliance. Get Kalinos. K O L Y N O S. Kalinos toothpaste at your drugstore tonight. Now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. This time, our story opens about a hundred miles from New York in a chemical plant in Connecticut. There's a hum of motors and a hiss of compressed air as Mr. Keene and his assistant, Mike Clancy, are guided across the floor amid great vats and retorts. Halfway across the floor, their guide, a thin, nearsighted man, pauses to answer a question. Oh, yes, Mr. Keene. Our production right now is entirely for the war effort. And I gather, Mr. Wallace, that this plant supplies chemicals for various types of explosives? Oh, yes. Shells, bombs, mines. My, my, my. Look at the size of them big vats over there. (laughs) Hitler wouldn't like to think of all the shooting that's going to come out of them, I'll bet. Quite right, Mr. Clancy, quite right. And that may have a lot to do with the reason that our manager, Mr. Morley, has sent for you two gentlemen. Well, why did he, Mr. Wallace? All I know is that he phoned my office yesterday in New York and asked me to come here the first thing this morning. What's happened? Well... I'm only in the personnel division. I'll have to let Mr. Morley talk for himself. If you'll come along to his office, uh, over there on the right. No, sir. Must be on the left. Uh, The left? Oh, yes. There's the sign. Manager. Oh, yes, yes. Forgive me for not knowing the way around my own plant. But I've broken my glasses, you see. I'm very nearsighted. Never mind, Mr. Wallace. We'll guide you. In fact, here we are right now. Uh, One moment while I knock. Come in. Good morning, Mr. Morley. Oh, good morning. Uh, you must be Mr. Keene. That's right. And this is my assistant, Mike Clancy. Glad to meet How you. How do you do, Mr. Clancy? Uh, won't you come inside, please, gentlemen? You too, Wallace. Yes. All right now, if you just sit down and make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. Now then, Mr. Morley, what's it all about? Well, I'll come right to the point, Mr. Keene. As you've probably noticed, this is a war plant and a very busy one. Oh. And right now, we're... Well, we've just received a very serious threat to our production. How? By the disappearance of a member of our staff. In fact, our best chemical engineer. Ooh, that is serious. There isn't another man in the plant who has his know-how. We must get him back as soon as possible. What's this man's name? Henry Trevor. And how old? Oh, 42 or so. Mm-hmm. When did he disappear? Three days ago. Under what circumstances? Well, I'll, uh, I'll let Wallace here tell you. Uh, Well, sir, it was late Monday afternoon. I went to Mr. Trevor's office to check a personnel matter, but he didn't have time to talk to me. He already had his hat and coat on, was leaving the plant. Uh, Not that he was a clock watcher. Oh, no, indeed. Continue, please. Well, Mr. Keene, there isn't much more to tell. Mr. Trevor left the plant and just never returned. You've checked at his home? 
Well, he has lodgings, but he never slept in his bed that night. Mm -hmm. Was he in any sort of private difficulties? No, none at all. Unless Wallace here has an idea. Oh? What is it, Mr. Wallace? You've heard how valuable Mr. Trevor is to us. Obviously, if anybody stands to profit from his disappearance... Oh, are you hinting that his disappearance may be the work of enemy agents? Yes, Mr. Key. Glory be. I don't know whether I'm permitted to tell you, but uh, perhaps Mr. Morley... Oh, I think I can refer to it in a general way. Mr. Keene, this plant has been working on an important new device. Oh, really? And Trevor was handling all the experiments. Well, that is important. And what's more, Mr. Keene? Yes, Mr. Wallace? When I went to his lodgings to make a check, I found that several strangers had taken rooms there recently. Really? Well, we'll have to look into that. But first, I'd like a few more facts on Trevor's professional background. Uh, Wallace can give you all that, Mr. Keene. Yes. In fact, I've dug up his folder from my files. Oh, if you don't mind reading it to me. Ye oh, dear me, my glasses. I'm half blind until they finish making me a new pair. I'll read it myself, then. Hmm. Notice Mr. Trevor came here only six months ago. Yes, that's correct. And before that... Why, all his previous experience was as a school teacher. Yes, quite so. Six months as chemistry instructor in the Tappingworth School for Boys. Before that, six months at the Jones Walton School. And then sick for a year in Nevada. Lung trouble, he said. But he was completely cured. And before his illness, 15 years at the Morton Latin School. This strikes me as very odd, Mr. Morley. Uh, what does? Here is a man who was content for 15 years to stay in one place, and then he becomes ill. When he recovers, he shows an extreme restlessness. He rushes from one job to another. Well, he told me that after he recovered his health, he started looking for better jobs. And here's another point. You say he was your best chemical engineer? Absolutely. But all his past experience was as a teacher. Something very much different. Well, Mr. Keene, he had a college degree in chemistry, so... Mm -hmm. We were mighty glad to have him, what with the shortage of technicians since the war. I still think that the only explanation is enemy agents. Well, possibly. Meanwhile, thanks for the information, Mr. Wallace. I'll pay a visit to his lodgings. Whatever you wish, Mr. Keene, but just find Trevor. We need him. I'll do my best. Come along, Mike. Okay, boss. If you'd like me to show you out... It won't be necessary. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Good. I have some other matters to discuss with Mr. Morley. Good day. Good day. Good day. I'll let you know just as soon as anything develops. Well, thank you, Mr. Keene. Well, boss, what do you think? First, let's get some facts, Mike, and then we'll think. Oh, you there, Mr. Keene? Well, boss, somebody's calling you. Mr. Keene? Yes, that girl over there by the machine. Yes, young woman? Mr. Keene, I heard Wallace mentioning your name when you came by before. You're the famous investigator, aren't you? Yes. Well, I guess you're up here to look for Mr. Trevor. You know about his disappearance? Why, sure, everybody knows. Well, do you have some information that might help me? Boss, I think she means... What do I mean? Well, somebody stuffed him into one of them big vats. <laughs> oh, no. What I wanted to say is, if you could get interested in women's hats... Women's hats? You might find out a whole lot more than you know right now. What do you mean by that? Uh, stop that machine for a moment. Sorry, I got work to do. Well, please, this is important. I told you all I can. Stop her, Mrs. Devon. Please, young woman, listen to me. No use, Mike. Let's get out into the hall. Women's hats. What does she mean by that? Mike, I have half an idea. On our way through the town, we stopped once to ask directions. Sure, in a cigar store. Did you notice what was next door? Oh, yes, a hat store. A very smart-looking little place. Unusual for a town like this. You think that's what the chick meant? Let's find out. Here we are, Mike. This is the place. And there's the owner's name on the window. Mrs. Lydia Groves. This is only a hunch, but I'm going to play it for all it's worth. Okay. Nobody here. There she comes now from the back room. A brunette. And darn good looking. 
Mrs. Groves? Yes, that's my name. You haven't come to buy hats? No, Mrs. Groves, to ask a question. I... I don't understand. When did you last see Henry Trevor? Henry Trevor? Yes, the engineer from the chemical plant. I... I don't know him. This is a small community. You must know it. I mind my own business, which is to make and sell hats. But, Mrs. Groves... And all my hats are for women. Good day, gentlemen. Oh, but, lady, this is important. You've made a mistake. Good day. Very well. Good day. Come along, Mike. Boss, do you think she was telling the truth? No, Mike, I don't. Enemy agent? Mike, in my long life, I found out that a beautiful woman can cause plenty of trouble without being anybody's agent. But this fellow Wallace said... We still need more information. The only way to get it... How, sir? Let's circulate around town and dig up every bit of gossip that we can. You hang around the lunch wagons, the gas stations. As for me, I'm going to get a haircut. Uh, take uh, more off the side, sir. That's right, Barber. Uh-huh. <clears throat> uh, nice day. Oh, it's a beautiful day. I think it's going to be warm after all. Definitely. Yes, sir, definitely. Yes, sir. I don't think I ever saw you around here before. I'm doing a job for the chemical plant. Oh, chemical plant. I believe our Mr. Trevor is one of your customers. Oh, sure, sure. Every two weeks. Interesting about him and Mrs. Groves, isn't it? Him and Mrs. <laughs> you know. The whole plant knows. <laughs> Funny thing, he took to her from the first day she come to this town and opened her shop. Thick as thieves, those two. Hmm. When did she first come to town? Uh, let me see, let me see. About the time my wisdom tooth was raising keen, uh, last September. Uh, take more off the side. Uh, yes, please. He hung around her shop all the time? Yes, till, till folks started talking. So then they uh, took to cover. <laughs> You know, uh, Thrush Lane. <laughs> They've been meeting there every night. Thrush Lane? Mm-hmm. Oh, all the spooning and mooning that goes on there. And just where is Thrush Lane? Oh, half a mile south of town, right by the factory. <coughs> what, uh, say, uh, what are you doing? Uh, you, you, you can't get up from the chair yet. Here's your money. I'll see you later. Uh, but I only done one side of your head. Uh, come back. <coughs> Crazy fella. Running off with only half a haircut. No, boss, there's nothing in the underbrush over here. Well, come over to this side. Oh, Mr. Keene, so sure we've been at it for three hours already. I know, Mike. This is our only real lead. Remember what the barber said. They met here every night. Oh, boss, take off your hat just once more. I will not. <laughs> the strangest haircut I ever did see. And you such a proper gentleman. Hmm. Here, help me put these branches aside. There. And you're still hoping to find Trevor's body out here in Thrush Lane. Not hoping. I'll be glad if I'm wrong. Well, there's nothing here. All right. Let's get back on the path. Mike, so far we can be sure of only one thing. What's that? Trevor and Mrs. Groves knew each other long before they ever came here. Of that I'm certain. You see, I found they arrived here actually within a week or two of each other. Uh, Trevor to take the job at the plant. And Mrs. Groves to open the shop. And then promptly they became friends. Then promptly... Yes, Mr. Keene? Well, what are you staring at? Something there on the ground, just a yard ahead of us. I don't see it. Well, look, Mike, from over here where the sun strikes it. Oh, sure, but what of it? Just those few little chunks. Come of... over here, Mike. Bend down. Help me pick them up. Okay, sir. Okay. Here. Mike, judging from the thickness of these fragments, I think we'd better have another talk with our friend, Mr. Wallace. <laughs> Mr. 
now for a moment while Mr. Keene and Mike examine their surprising find. Next time you meet the most successful man you know or the most popular girl, take a good look at their teeth. Chances are they'll be sparkling and beautiful with all the magnetism your own smile should have. Then examine your own teeth critically. If they're not every bit as brilliant and gleaming as they should be, if they show signs of being discolored by surface film, just do as thousands do. Try the new Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. Safely, speedily, Colonos helps brush away masking surface film, revealing the natural luster and brightness of your teeth. Your druggist has an ample supply of Colonos on hand, so get a tube tonight and see what wonders it may do in helping you to add to the charm and appeal of your smile. Remember the name, Colonos, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. And now back to the chemical plant where Mr. Keene has a quiet talk with the helpful Mr. Wallace. Yes, Mr. Keene? Is there something more you wanted to know? One or two little details, Mr. Wallace. Fire away, Mr. Keene, fire away. Were you aware, Mr. Wallace, that Henry Trevor was very friendly with a Mrs. Groves? I wouldn't know about that, sir. Well, did you ever notice what route Trevor took when he left the factory at night? Oh, uh, back to his lodgings, I suppose. By way of Thrush Lane? Didn't you ever notice whether he made a practice of going through Thrush Lane? Did he? I never had any occasion for walking there myself. No? Wallace, when did you break your glasses? My, my glasses? Why, several days ago. Where? Right here, in my office. Pretty thick lenses, I gather. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. That's why I'm having trouble getting them replaced. Wallace, take a look at these. I mean, these fragments in my hand. Well, how can I, without my glasses? Take them into your hand. Feel them. Bits of broken glass. Very thick bits. The kind of glass that might be used in the spectacle of a very nearsighted man. I don't know what you're driving at, sir. I found these 20 minutes ago in Thrush Lane. Well... The world's full of nearsighted men. Are you sure one of them didn't follow Henry Trevor into the woods last Monday night and overhear his conversation with Mrs. Groves? I, I'm sure that this one did not. Are you quite finished, sir? One thing more. Do you have any photographs of Henry Trevor in your files? You must have. Yes, sir. I'd like to have one. At once. <laughs> Well, boss, what are you up to now? I'm going on a little trip, Mike. Where to? Back into Henry Trevor's past. <laughs> Dr. Grange, you are the headmaster of the Tappingworth School? Oh, yes, for 20 years. Do you recognize this photograph? Why, yes, this is Henry Trevor. He taught chemistry here last year. Excellent grasp of his subject, too. I wish he'd stayed. What can you tell me of his background? Why, he came here from the Jones Walton School with the usual references. That's all you know? Well, yes, Mr. Keene. Thank you, Dr. Grange. Oh, yes. Yes, Mr. Trevor taught here for one term at the Jones Walton School. He got along well, Miss Mott? Yes, our girls simply adored him. Where had he been before? Uh, he'd been sick, I believe, for a year. Before that, the Morton Latin School. Look at this photograph, please. Is that a good resemblance? Hmm. Perfect. Well, Mr. Keene, we had Mr. Trevor with us here at the Morton School for 15 years, until he became ill. And then he went to Nevada for his health, Dr. Hines? Uh, quite so. You never heard from him again? Only when other schools asked us about his references. I wonder if, uh, if you would have a photograph of him. Well, we should. Any one of the yearbooks. Here, let me see on this shelf up here. Ah, oh, yeah, the yearbook of 1940. That will do very well. Ah, there we are, Mr. Jean. You say that's Henry Trevor? Of course. Well... Let me show you a photograph, Dr. Hines. This one. 
Hmm. How good a resemblance is this one? Uh, Mr. Keene, this is the strangest thing. Do you have time for a story? All the time in the world. Go right ahead. Well, Mr. Keene, I began to wonder what had happened to you. I've been away, Mr. Morley, for two days. Any luck? Any trace of Trevor? Yes and no. What do you mean by that? He's alive all right and well. I'm sure of that. Well, that's... But uh, where he is and whether he wants to be found, that's something else. Mr. Keene, all I know is that I've got to have him back at the plant. He's done fine and important work here. We need him desperately. All right, Mr. Morley. That makes it a whole lot easier. Mr. Keene, it's you again. Yes, Mrs. Groves. Mr. Keene, if you've come to plague me with questions again. No. No more questions. Because I know the answers. I... I'm not feeling well. Please come back some other time. Now is the best time. You see, Mrs. Groves, I've just finished tracing back the history of Henry Trevor. Or rather, the man who called himself Henry Trevor. I don't understand... The real Henry Trevor died two years ago in Nevada. But I told you that I know nothing about it. And the moment he died, his identity was borrowed by someone else. In fact, by his brother, John Trevor. Oh. Yes, there were two Trevors, John and Henry. Both were trained in chemistry. Henry became a teacher. John became an engineer. John, the engineer, was very successful, made heaps of money. But his wife spent it even faster than he made it. I know nothing about it. In the end, this led John to embezzle $5,000 from his company. He and his wife ran away, wandered all over the country, used up every cent they had. Because there was no job that John could apply for without giving himself away. Interesting, but I don't see how... Finally, a... two years ago, the real Henry Trevor, the quiet schoolmaster, died. Immediately, John saw a chance to borrow his brother's identity and make a new start. And so John became Henry. Uh, how, how did you find all this out? By going back to the Morton School. The headmaster remembered the scandal about the embezzlement very well and how much sorrow it caused Henry at the time. All that I had to do was to show him the photograph of the man who claimed to be Henry. Quite simple, really, Mrs... John Trevor. What did you call me? You are the wife of John Trevor, the man I've been asked to find. Oh, I... I don't suppose there's any use now to deny it. None. Yes. It was my extravagance that caused the trouble. I wanted things John couldn't afford. Believe me, I regret the whole thing. We, we've struggled so hard to live it down. But Wallace found out. The man at the chemical plant. Yes, by, by following us to Thrush Lane several times and overhearing our conversation. And then he tried to blackmail your husband? Yes. And last Monday night, after John left me, Wallace came along again to ask for money. Five hundred dollars. Otherwise, he would expose John. But your husband refused. Yes, he, he began to scuffle with Wallace. But then he became frightened and decided it was no use. He decided he'd have to run away once again. Where is he now? Don't ask me. Please don't. But you must tell me. No. He's my husband. And this was all my fault in the first place, Mr. Keene. It was my foolishness and vanity that caused John to embezzle the money. Oh, please go now. But Mrs. Trevor... I beg you, please the go. The telephone. Mrs. Trevor, the reason that you want me out of here... Would it be because your husband is right now calling you on the telephone? I have nothing more to say. Pick up the phone, Mrs. Trevor. Answer it. But, Mr. Keene... And tell your husband that I want to see him in my office in New York. Any time tomorrow, if he can make it. I... I don't know. Please do as I say. You won't regret it. Well, boss... Do you think he'll come? I have every hope, Mike. But it's almost five in the afternoon already. Ah, oh, no. He won't come. 
Not a guy who embezzled five grand and stole his brother's name. There's one thing you've overlooked. What's that, sir? Come in. Good afternoon, Mrs. Trevor. Good afternoon. You came alone? No, not alone. Oh, you're John Trevor? Yes. Come right in, both of you. This is Mike Clancy, my assistant. How do you do? How are you? Sit down now. Mr. Keene, my wife says you insisted on my coming to see you. I wouldn't have done it except I was sick of hiding. Trevor, I want to ask a question. If you had the chance to make restitution for that $5,000, would you do it? Mr. Keene, why do you think we've been slaving for the past two years? I had any job I could get and Lydia in one hat shop after another to save enough money to pay back. Well, why didn't you get in touch with your old firm? Because we've only got $2,000 so far. Because I was afraid of what attitude they might take. Well, Trevor, there are two things that impress me about this case. First, that you and your wife have worked so hard ever since you made that mistake. Second, that you've proved yourself so valuable to the war effort. Oh, it's nice of you to say that, Mr. Keene, but... No buts. I'll be glad to accept the $2,000 you've saved so far. And let you pay off the rest in installments. What did you say? I got a telegram this morning from your old firm. What? Let me read it. In view of circumstances as explained by you, we are delighted to accept your check and drop all charges against John Trevor. Oh. Why, Mr. Keene, you mean you went ahead and... I took a chance on you, too. I paid off the $5,000 with my personal check. Oh, how wonderful of you, Mr. Keene. Oh, certainly is, but... But there's still Mr. Morley. I've already made your excuses to him. Well, what did you tell him? The truth. The best excuse of all. And he still wants me back? He'd be very much obliged if you'll take the next train out of here for Connecticut. Oh, Mr. Keene. You'll find one little change, though, at the factory. What do you mean? Mr. Wallace has suddenly resigned. Mr. Keene, how can we ever thank you? What kindness. What understanding. Never mind the speeches. You'll miss your train. Along with you. There's a war on, you know. Listen next week at the same time as Mr. Keene brings us the case of murder in the air. tragedies strike deeper than the loneliness of a girl or woman who is unpopular. A girl who dresses smartly, looks pretty, is gay and charming, but whose teeth, when seen at close range, rob her of the very charm she strives for. And the same thing is true of the man who must sell himself socially and in business, and whose teeth create an unpleasant effect on others. If you have the slightest suspicion that your teeth are holding you back from social or business success, do as hundreds of thousands have recently done, and that is start cleaning your teeth with the new Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. Its action is like that of a jeweler's polish, removing tarnish from a piece of silver. Try it just once, and then you'll know why people everywhere are changing to this new high-polishing toothpaste, Colonos, and learning the meaning of teeth that can gleam and shine, that give your smile new personality and charm. You can get the new Colonos in any drugstore tonight. It's spelled K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos Toothpaste. You've been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now on the air at a new time, every Thursday night, 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night when the kindly old tracer turns to the case of murder in the air. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colonos Toothpaste and inviting you to listen to Friday on Broadway at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime over most of these stations tomorrow night. There is a wonderful new way to make floors sparkle like new in six to nine minutes flat. 
Use Aero Wax, the self-polishing wax that goes on in a jiffy, dries without rubbing. Its marvelous high luster adds beauty to your rooms, saves countless scrubbings. Yet it costs only 25 cents a full pint. Get Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.